Hey, folks. Heads up that this episode includes some adult language. Hi, I'm Jennifer Jill Araya. And I'm Sarah Beth Gower. Welcome to the Crafting Audiobooks podcast, where we discuss the art and craft of audiobooks, and we aim to go deep quick. Hello, everybody. Super excited to share that today we are talking with Vikas Adam, who is a narrator. And then we were talking before we started rolling. He's also a performer. He's also a storyteller. But those words are encompassed in narrator. But does everybody know that and think of it that way? So that's where we're beginning the conversation today is like, what is the title and why? What are your thoughts on that, Vikas? Well, first of all, hi. Hey, Jennifer. Hi, Sarah. Thank you for having me on. It's an absolute delight, and I'm so happy we were able to we're able to do this. Um, yeah, that's an interesting thought because it's it's more so. What does my question is? What does the general public do when they hear the word narrator? Do they make an assumption that it's literally that old trope of, oh, it's easy. You just get into a booth and you read a book, or <laughs> Or so has the concept has the concept of narrator now started to become inclusive of the performance aspect and the fact? So it's like I'm always torn. It's like because as narrators, we are narrators, we are storytellers, we are performers. We are always talking about how you know you have to perform when you're in here, and you're performing for as y'all know hours on end, and and we get. I don't know about you, but it's like there's like the anxiety of like before we get into the booth sometimes when on the first day of like, oh, shit, am I am I ready for this book? Am I am am I prepped enough? Am I scared? And I found that there are times where I'm like, I'm putting off wanting to start because I'm like anxious about like, oh, this is the performance. What are are we ready? It's that stage fright. But then once we get into it, it's like, oh, it's smooth sailing. Um, So I don't know. It's 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 a big it's a big question, and especially now that we are finding audiobooks beginning to really make its way into the public eye. Yeah, have you all been watching and just like that, the Sex in the City no, follow up. I haven't. So tell us about they it. They have had two episodes that have had to do with audiobooks completely separate from each other storyline wise. Oh my gosh. What? I'm going to have to watch what? this. In one episode, um, Carrie Bradshaw's recording her memoir. So she's in the booth and she's recording. And, you know, that's 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 one thing. But then there's another storyline where one of the other characters. Um, me, sorry, spoiler alert. Um, <laughs> goes to a bookstore, sees and they're having a the the big chain. Austin romance novel audiobook narrator celebrity there doing a reading and she walks into the bookstore and it's this it's Miriam Shore the actress who's fucking amazing um in anything she does if you don't know her look her up um but she's there and she's dressed in this red number this like red over leather overcoat red pants red turtleneck hair slicked back and she's doing this reading and you've got all her fans right there and then there's this like potential romance uh that happens between the two of that between Miranda and sorry spoilers Miranda and her <laughs> but she goes to her place in New York and of course, the comedy of it is it's the complete opposite and her place is a total mess and it's this tiny studio and you see this little recording area for her and it's not a booth. It's barely a makeshift like area. And I'm like going, that's not what we do. Even in New York, that wouldn't fly for all the audio books that you do, especially to be at the level that they're putting her at. And so the fact that that's making it into the way of like the public consciousness um, in the media, I think that's amazing and it's fun, but is, are, are people going to be really correlating the performance aspect of what we do? Or is it now just going to be a, you know, a, a, an idea, a trope, like if that mm-hmm. makes sense. For sure. Yeah. 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 And what I hear you saying underneath that is that you are really passionate about people understanding that what we do is a storytelling 
art. And so you find yourself when you go to say, what is my title questioning? Because inherently, if you say narrator and storyteller, are you implying the narrator wasn't the storyteller? If you just say narrator, are you you're leaving it to the consciousness of the public and who knows what they're understanding or thinking? Yeah. And it's because I have such respect for because we we've got our we've got our storytellers you know we've got the moth we've got you know uh, and 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 moth like festivals and storytelling festivals and oh my god the respect I have for these people um, whenever I've seen it and it's respect for stand up comics for being able because they're telling stories too and and you know I'll be in a different in in a different manner but. It's all, it's all, I think we're all interrelated in that way. And the respect and love I have for these people that can do it and do it well. And I just, I want people to recognize that with what all of us are doing and, and to, especially in (laughs) considering what's happening, you know, in the big touchy subject of, of AI. I mean, I'm curious, do you, would they even consider having AI stand up? Hmm. AI stand up, yeah. AI um, storytelling. I mean, I can't imagine a moth where there's an AI that tells one of those stories. That's just incomprehensible. Yeah, but here we here we are, and and yeah. I'm. Yeah, it's about the humanity, uh, and and really, you know. Reminding people of that. Not that there's anything wrong with AI. I really do think there's there's a place for it and it's going to be helpful. And there's so many ways it's going to be helpful. It's just it's when it's infringing on the human experience and trying to substitute and take over what could be the human experience. That's when I get really, really um, protective. Yeah, for sure. And honestly, I think the more that we are open and talking about the fact that narration is storytelling and is performance, that's... Mm-hmm our little way of contributing to saying, Hey, this is, this is on the same level as, as true storytelling and true performance. It's, they're indistinguishable. They're one of the same. Mm-hmm. And then it's like a spiritual surrender because like the three of us know that there are lots of listeners who know that there are lots of people in this business who know that, but we don't get to control like what the general public like ends up accepting and how much humanity they demand and keep asking for versus what they settle for. And we'll find out. And also the joy of the joy of the joy of the human mistake, the joy <laughs> of the human error. <laughs> I, I, I'm not a fan of like that, that perfect perfection in a box type of thing. I always like a little, there's gotta be a little something that for me, we're all a little off. As humans, I'm 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 suspicious of perfection, <laughs> um, and so even when we've got our human human storytellers, the fact that you know it's not going to be you know someone making this perfect voice or sometimes not making the perfect accent, but if I know that there is a, if I'm part of knowing that I'm part of the journey where it's this one storyteller or two storytellers doing these telling us this story, I'm on with them, and I I'm going to be forgiving. If so and so cannot do the most perfect opposite gender voice or accent or something, but as long as there's an awareness, as long as one's not coming in, the storyteller's not coming into it with this hubris of like, well, you know, I know it all, and I'm, I'm and I'll be all. If it's if we're coming in with humility and the true intent that I am doing my 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 best to tell this story. Uh, and to help you visualize this story, uh, that's then I think that then we're we're, we're all on the 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 ride with them. That's beautiful. Absolutely. We've been talking a lot about the imperfection of humanity, um, and how that is a beautiful uh, value add to the audiobook storytelling. And it really struck me, you know, right at the beginning of this interview, you were talking about how you get performance anxiety and, you know, it crosses my mind. It's easy for me to project like, yeah, but you're Vikas Adam. Like you're very highly considered in this industry. You know what you're doing. It's easy for me to project that onto you and not imagine that like you're getting nervous too. And I think what you're speaking to, like the embracing of that humility, that imperfect, that acceptance of imperfection is probably part of what makes your performances um, so compelling. Thank you. I just, I think it's, I, I mean, I remember these, these are, 
These are books that have, and stories that have been written by these authors that have been, they've taken so long to write them. And I know that I'm going to, and, and then there are fans who are going to be, and listeners who are going to be spending this time with them and spending, and it's, and it's always this, it's that, I think it's that artist need of like, you know, you want it, it's that perfectionism, you know, it's like you, we're striving for that perfection. We're striving for, we want to please everybody. <laughs> but at the same time, knowing that, we're not going to please everyone. I mean, that big joke we always talk about is audiobook narrators. You got a hundred great reviews, yet you're focusing on the one that just poo poos you. And yeah. it's, and it's like, you know. Yeah, let's stop doing that and instead focus on the bringing our, yeah. hu- our imperfect human heart yeah. to the page. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, I find myself curious because. What is one book that you yeah. think is an example of you at your best as an audiobook artist and why? Well, oh, fuck me. Um, <laughs> oh, I can't wait to hear this. I mean, I, I, I can't say that there is one because I'm proud of so many very recently. And I, um, you know, I'm obviously I'm proud of Pi. I'm proud of uh, uh, Life of Pi. Uh, I'm mm-hmm. proud of uh, A Fine Balance. Um Mainly because I was able to, with no with no disrespect to the other narrators who had taken those stories first, but as a South Asian to be able to tell these very South Asian stories mm-hmm. um, and to be able to infuse the, you know, infuse my authentic self into that interpretation um, it, it was it was an honor, and so there's there is a pride there. But very recently, I just finished recording um, the Museum of Failures by Thriti Umragar. And uh, if you don't know Thriti, um, she's a journalist, um, but she's also a writer, and she wrote the book Honor, um, which was on Reese's Book Club last year. And this particular book was very very special to me. I really wanted it when they were auditioning for it. Um, it's about a a man who lives in America who's who's from Indian, uh, who's from India, <laughs> and he's he's Parsi, so he's Zoroastrian. And for those who don't know, the Parsi uh, people, um, Parsis are what um, the Zoroastrians who um, became refugees in India centuries ago are known as, and um, famous. Parsis include Freddie Mercury and Zubin Mehta. Hmm. And um, so, and my mom, my maternal side is Parsi. And so it was very, very important to me to, I was like, I read, I read the, the part of the book and I was just like, I've got to do this. And he comes back to India with the intent to adopt um, a child and his mother, his estranged mother is in the hospital. And so begins the journey of healing and uh, Family Secrets. And it's such a human book and it's such a beautiful book. But what really did it for me was they asked me, based on the audition, there are a few sections um, where his mother, we get her point of view. And they, 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 Triti and, and, and the publisher liked what I did with her voice. And so they asked me, would you be willing to do her, her sections as well? So you just do the whole thing, which was a huge honor for me. And I was like, absolutely, yes, because I felt very, very connected to it. But also because for me, a double side, because I also did a book called Tell Me How to Be a, a couple of years ago um, by Neil Patel. And that also was a book about a mother and a son's relationship. But in that book, it was um, the son and her had alternating chapters, first first person point of view. And so to be able to do now these two Indian mothers and to do their their points of view to speak from them and they're do- and they're both sides of the same coin with the sons but to be able to explore these two different women and to give their voice make them as completely different from each other as possible it wasn't just indian mother voice the parsis have a different accent they have a different cadence to went the way they speak versus um the indian mother from who's lived in america now for for years um from tell me how to be so in a long-winded way, these these two books are really, really 
particularly special to me. And I'm, and, and I'm very uh, much looking forward to people hearing Museum of Failures because it's... Uh, I was working with Christina Rooney. Do you all know Christina Rooney, the mm-hmm. director? Yeah. And we were both working on it. And, and it was day four when all the, when all the, the challenging portions came in. Mm-hmm. And when you've got good writing excellent writing. It's amazing how it energizes you. So no matter how difficult things may be, how tired you may be, and you've read, and we've read the damn thing. We know what's going on. You know what I mean? Every, (laughs) we know what's going to happen, but we're still in that state of, I cannot wait to find out what happens next, even though I know what happens next. And to explore it from this performance aspect, um, you know, it's, it's a, it's such a gift. Um, it's such a gift to be able to do what we do. Absolutely. Yeah. So yeah, I think in a roundabout way, that's those at the moment, those are, those are a couple of my favorites. Thank you so much for sharing all of that because you've definitely added books to my to be listened list for sure. Um, but I love how the books that you talked about are ones that really spoke to you as an artist and spoke to your lived experience. Uh-huh. But I also love books that, that don't. I'm, mm-hmm. I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm, I'm someone who's so fortunate and so lucky. I get to genre hop a lot. Um, and for the longest time I thought I was like, Oh, it's, uh, I get to, it's, everybody's doing it right. Yeah. I mean, aren't you doing it? And, 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 and to really find out that what I get to do, I'm so f- fortunate and so lucky that I, as a young actor, one of the things I always wanted to do was I was like, I want to be, you know, I, want, I can play everything, the bottom, I'm, let, me, let me be the lion too. But it literally was one of those, I don't, I didn't want to just be the character actor. I also wanted to be the leading man. And at the same time, I didn't want to just do, I didn't want to just be, be pigeonholed into one thing. And the fact that I've been able to find that, 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 dream and that have that vision manifest have that vision manifest as a voiceover artist and as, as in audio books i mean it's it's one of those mind blowing things where i never would have thought that before so i'm i i just consider myself one of the luckiest people i think about that often there's that saying i might have already said it on the in a different podcast episode but that saying that film is a director's medium, television is a writer's medium, and theater is an actor's medium. And I always think, no, audiobooks are an actor's medium. <laughs> we truly, oh my Absolutely. goodness. Absolutely. I mean, Absolutely. I'm, and I'm always looking at how, from a director standpoint because I'm, I'm, I'm a, I'm a theater director as well, and you know, and and writer and and obviously performer, and and I come from a physical theater movement background. So it's like for me, character building and and directing, I'm always looking at each book as its own piece and trying to figure out tonally what is going on with it. What is the book asking for? And it may not be something that I'm not expecting the listeners to be able to like deconstruct my personal method at approaching it, but I still have to have my method of how how am I approaching this one? You know, an, an example... Of that is uh, <laughs> Beholder by Ryan Lasala for Scholastic and being able to read, because there's two distinct narration narrators mm-hmm. and there's your main one and then there's another one. <laughs> <It's> <laughs> and, spoilers. And, no spoilers, yeah. <laughs> and, and it, it happens from the very beginning. It gets, it, it becomes, it alternates. But I had to, you, you know, I had to look at the writing and I had to go, okay, how big can I go? And that's when also having wonderful producers um, to be able to talk this through and, and, and giving me uh, time so that, you know, I wouldn't feel pressured to have to do this other narration immediately. I was able to like record out of order until we both, we all came to a consensus Nice. Um, it's very, it's very exciting. And that's when it like feels wonderful versus just feeling as though you're in a machine and being told, no, we got a deadline. We got to go. No, no, come on, come on, come on. Bam. 
I would love to circle back to what you were saying about what you're focusing on as you're actually doing the recording. And Mm. when you are recording, Mm. where and how is your focus? Are you thinking about your physical body? Are you just totally in the universe of the book? Um, Does that change if you're doing narration versus dialogue? Um, It's all of the above, and it it very much depends on the book and it depends on the story it's like you know the genre the storytelling method the whether there's whether there's like in uh museum of failures there are the sections where shirin his mother begins speaking um one of the things i spoke about with christina and with triti and 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 our producers with with laura is all the dialogue in there, I was like, I did not want to do any character voices. I wanted her specifically to be doing that, the speaking the dialogue as if she's telling the story and recounting it. Um, because everywhere else, it was like changing up the voices non nonstop. And during, during that 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 time, um, it was. I'm still. I'm I'm getting a little choked up right now thinking about it because um, that was an example of being able to just be in the text and being right there. And it's that actor's gift that we're always wanting, those experiences that we're always dreaming of. Um, and that was one that was right, that was right there um, versus, versus books that have the different voices and, and the dialogue, uh, I may, I think sometimes then in order to keep doing the scene, I do have to adjust my body. And if there's a long winded narrative, like if I'm doing, you know, if there was Rushdi, for example, which has like paragraphs um, and it switches ideas all the time, I sometimes have to use, just use my hand as, as if I were on stage doing an exercise where I'd be usually walking it out and changing my, my traffic patterns um, in order to discover the different beats. Or using your body physically to figure out what the oral differences are going to be. Did that answer your question? It did. (laughs) That was beautiful. I do. I do end up though. I do fall into a cinematic view though. If there is a description, I am suddenly in, I'm in, I'm like in the, in the world and I'm, especially when it's beautifully written, how can you not be? And taken in and I am tracking along camera wise and I'm with that character and, and, you know, example, the East Indian by Brindak Jati, which was, so, once again, another one of those amazing books um, that I got to do. And anything that can take us away. And we all, everyone is going to be different with what can take them away. You know, for some, it's going to be, whether it's going to be that beautiful literary fiction or whether it's going to be the children's story, whether it's going to be a bottle of Calgon, I don't know. But, you know, it's like, what is it that's going to be able to... um pull us from this world and and that is always my goal with every book that I'm reading that I can connect to it in a way where it'll pull me in because I feel that if I'm pulled in then maybe it's a little easier to allow someone else to join us for the ride so what I'm hearing you say like if you're going to sum it up of where is your focus when you're recording is you're doing whatever you need to do for that particular title yeah. so that you are so completely immersed because maybe if you are the listener will be too yeah because it's not it's not a cookie cutter it's it's as if it's with our with our acting work we can't we can't approach how we would do a musical the way we would do we can't approach doing let's just say uh, uh annie the musical the way we would approach doing Beckett. Yeah. There's going to be a different, you're going to approach it differently and and there's no wrong way except to think that there's only one way. I love that you got more specific about what musical because as a musical lover, I was like, wait, that's not fair to the genre of musicals. It's a broad <laughs> generalization. Yeah, yeah, and that's why, that's why, you know, I had to get very specific because I was just like going, oh, wait, no, 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 no. Um, 
But yeah. Yeah. Brings it back to the same conversation we're talking about, how each book is distinct as well. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. And and it always... It, it, I get, I love those. My, my, my sister was driving cross country and she was doing like the long, long rides. And I was like, okay, are you okay? What's going on? She's like, yeah, I'm just listening to my true crime podcast. It's all good. And I'm, I'm like going, you're fine with that? And she's like, yeah, I'm fine with that. It's kind of relaxing. <laughs> like, That's what you said. Different people get immersed yeah, by different things. Yeah. Exactly. To each his own. <laughs> yeah. And then it can inspire artists to go make something that could only come from their brains because they Absolutely. identify with the thing. Like I'm now I'm thinking of only murders in the building and how like yeah. you you can't make that show you unless can. you understand what it is to be someone who is comforted by listening to true crime podcast, you know. But also the way that they also they are not afraid of the of genre defying. They're, 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 they're not staying into one cookie cutter mold. They have created their own world and there are rules in that world. You can talk to the, to, to the victim. They're, they're, they're talking to the victims and, and having conversations with them. And that to me is like incredible. How often do we get to do that? But it's still funny and it's still compelling. And, how can we honor our unique voices while also honoring the author's unique voices mm -hmm. and not yeah. trying to quote unquote narrate like so-and-so not trying to narrate like so-and-so it, you know, finding your own voice, finding your own niche, um, starting there and maybe then, you know, branching out, um, but yeah, absolutely. I always really like the image of audiobooks as a co-creative act between the author and the narrator. It is that it's together the author and the narrator are co-creating something that's completely new. I and I will I will take it one step further and and I will say I, I don't just like the idea. I will fight um, anyone who says that it is not you know, um, a co-creative uh, endeavor because we all know if someone doesn't like, there's always the, the, turn this person off after listening for five minutes, didn't even bother, picked up the book or whatever, yeah. or, you know, turned off completely by it, you know? And, and, and so, yeah, I'm very big on, we're, we're, we're definitely, we're partners in this. When diving more specifically into character voices when you do have the dialogue and the book is calling for those distinctive characters. Could you tell us a little bit more about your process of developing those characters, what uh -huh. influences, how you choose the voice for each character, et cetera? The clues in the text, number one. Um, the dialogue. Once again, if you've got a good writer, they, they'll be able to... Uh, it's it's they're hearing it so when they're writing it they're writing it in a way that it feels very natural um to be able to tap into their cadence and i don't mean by having to change spellings or like working in an accent like writing it in in like uh as if it were an accent uh but to be able to even grammatically adjusting for example, uh, someone someone from from India may place uh, a, a verb in a different place. An adverb may come beforehand, and it's there in the writing, so it feels natural to be able to go into that. Um, I recall doing 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 a a book where it took took place in France. The 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 the, the boy was the main character was French. It was it was first person. It was in my early days. And I was like, oh, I have to do it in a French accent. But it was written with an American mm. um, thought, you know, it was written by an American writer. So the so so the vernacular, the 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 style was very American. So what the fuck was I thinking, you know, do a do a French accent? It sounded I I, I personally am very, very critical, you know, but it was a learning, it was a learning um moment for me where I was like, okay, 
nope, that one should have been American, probably. Yeah. Um, so it's about seeing what's going to be best. I've got, you know, I've got a, uh, uh, a book coming out that takes place in, that I've got to record that's, that's taking place in like historic, prehistorical times. But in reading the book, the dialogue has kind of a snappy, almost <laughs> modern feel. So I'm like going, yes, because <laughs> that gives me that permission to be able to have fun with that and not have to be so reverential because it's, you know, historical. Sure. Yeah. Sure. What I'm hearing you say is that everything's in the text, that what the author gives us tells us what those characters need to sound like. They do. But then to also, also to a degree, and, and you'll know when you're reading it, where is the chance, where is the place that you can elevate? And when it comes to character voices, when, when is it best to keep those voices very, 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 very subtle? Or can I take it big and make it as animated as possible? Um, what energy can I infuse into it? And sorry to go back to answering your question, Sarah. Sorry. Uh, the text tells me, but, but, but I, it's like whenever I would do stage work and I was doing a different show, I didn't have just one particular way of working on character. It would depend on where I'm at at that place in life, <laughs> um, what I felt I needed to do to explore character wise, and then also what, what the text was saying. So I have, I've, I've created and I've explored and, and, and mined different character creation processes. Um, is that a word process processes? Processes. Which one is it? I think it's processes. <laughs> process. Well, I'm, I'm, Canadian, so I say processes. So, <laughs> so, but yeah, the, hello. You ever want to like think that you know the English language, become an audiobook narrator? Right. Um, Indeed. Oh my God. <laughs> anything. Um, there are so many normal words. I have to look up every single time. I just had this argument this morning with, with my uh, spouse about, he was like, uh, Azure. And I'm like, going, I think it's Azure. And he, he was like playfully um, berating me about, you know, not knowing how to pronounce things. Um, and of course, I had like five dictionary apps on my thing. And I'm going, no, no, let's keep on exploring this. Is it possible that <laughs> Azure is English? Is it? Let's look in the English dictionary. Right. And, check and, check and, the and, Oxford. <laughs> and he's he's like, I'm, I'm just done. I'm done. Can we move on to the next conversation? I'm just done with this part. This was just supposed to be a one-off joke. It was just like, you're just, you're killing, you're killing the joke, Vic. Oh, the joy of living with an audiobook narrator. <laughs> <sighs> Oh, um, did that answer your question? I'm sorry. Did that did that, did that answer? It totally did. And, and if it didn't, I want to yeah. I want to dig into one little part of it. So Go. you've created the character based on what the the text is guiding you to do. Yeah. But now you go to perform the characters. Uh -huh. Where do you focus on how you're producing the voice at all, or are you just like in the scene and it comes naturally, the voice sort of organically comes through you? Like, what do you, how, what's that process? What are you doing when you go to actually speak as the character? I channel. That's the way I like to look at it. Um, I, I almost feel like I have a visual of what the character looks like. And it's all, it's like, it's, it's so simultaneous. It's like, I've got a vision of what the character looks like. And then I've also got sometimes like the, I will know what the character is doing and you know, how their, how their body is, um, what their posture is. And, and I will naturally fall into it or there will be a motion that's sometimes happens. And, and some like, uh, I'm, I've, I've been doing this series for podium where the these four main characters five main characters um are very very different and so i really was able to play with them but it's like so after like you know six books you're used to that and you can just go into it but we've got the sorceress who's very who's who, who enjoys the innuendos and who's mm -hmm. very sassy and saucy um and so when she's she's got this 
she's got this really like saucy kind of voice. And I'm just going to speak like this during whenever she's saying anything. But then the fun comes when she's got a serious moment. Hmm. How do we still keep that? But people still know that it's her. I got a kick out of it. But then, you know, this orc then I'm like, going, all right, well, he's kind of a big dude. And so initially when the book started, I was like, okay, you know, he kind of sounds like this. But then it turns out he's a lot, he's, he's, there's a lot more to him and he just sounds like that. So then I had to question, oh shit, did I, am I, do I need to change his voice? I was like, no, that's the way he speaks. That's what, who he is. As long as I can continue speaking like this and I can speak about the importance of society and what society's norms are expecting upon us as orcs but i know that we as a people will be able to move forward and he can whatever big words i'm just fucking making that shit up (laughs) but it's like but he can have a serious conversation and still have that voice and still be him if that makes sense it's actually the opposite of stereotyping like you worry did i stereotype him and then you go no this is this this creature this soul and he can speak like this and still have deep thoughts Mm -hmm. um I love that. And for our, this is the, I think the first time I've been like, oh no, I wish that we did have a video podcast because y'all who are listening, the cost was the, as he went to create the voice, he was very physical. Like, you know, he was staying still in that he needs to, you know, be in a certain position to the mic, but like he was moving his hands, he was moving his body. um, Just, uh, it was, um, so it's like your body partially answered our question too. You really physicalize to shift characters as well. Thank you. Yeah, the energy in your shoulders was changing. The angle that you were, you know, keeping your head was changing. It was amazing to watch. It's funny so. when I go, I go that <laughs> I, whenever I do that, that that the that the sorceress voice. It's like I always find, yeah, it's like my relation to the mic. It's like I always end up turn, turning like this almost. But then it's <laughs> like with, with another character, I'll just be like face forward, and, and I haven't gotten any notes about it, like, changing the sound, so I'm doing something fine. Um, <laughs> I, I have to put that as a caveat. Don't just be doing stuff that's gonna yeah, fuck true. up your <laughs> fuck up your editors and fuck up your you know... Engineers. Uh, the, the editing process, because you still you we're all a team, and it's not you know, we have to be able to do stuff to make everyone's lives easier. Absolutely. Oh, thank you so much for digging into all of that, because well, we you. have... Reached our last question, which all of us are going to answer, um, but because I'd love for you to start. And the question is this, what are you finding exciting and energizing about the craft of audiobooks right now today? I am finding that it's like I said earlier, the fact that we are becoming a lot more mainstream and part of the norm and there is a recognition for the craft that we are doing for for what we do so every time i do say i I record audiobooks there is this like there's this ding moment in in people's uh eyes and they always want to know more and so that's that's really really that's that's a really happy exciting place for me for sure, that our art is being recognized more publicly. I mean, hello, it's on and just like that. <laughs> Twice. <laughs> Two separate storylines. Two That's separate a- episodes. <laughs> I love it. How about Sarah? you two? Yeah, Sarah, what about you? What's exciting to you today? I am reflecting today on the fact that my subconscious knows more than my conscious mind does. And so, yes, it is very important that I keep building my skill and applying my techniques. But if I try overly hard to control what's pouring forth and make sure like, you know, I'm in charge of this and the technique is happening how I think it should, then I'm actually you know, choking the beauty of what's possible. And um, I actually brought, so there's this quote that I'm obsessed with by a human named Michelle Gaugi. And it's a longer quote and I'm obsessed with the whole thing, but I'm going to read a little piece of it yes, that yes. to what I just said, because it's just Please so do. good. Okay. <laughs> Release your work into the world for others to find whatever they can. Mm. That is what art is for. <clears throat> whatever you believed your intention to be, the deeper parts of you exceeded that. And that other stuff is what viewers will find in the mysterious alchemy of art 
as your work makes its way in the world. Oh, oh wow. Can you send me that? that Can you send me that? Oh, send me that. Send me that. Send me oh, that. Oh, sure. Please. I'll yeah, send I you think the whole maybe, thing. Yes, please. Maybe in the show notes, you need to link to that. Yeah, that's that, that gorgeous. Source. That is beautiful, Sarah. So um, I'm going to answer my what's exciting to me by sort of talking a little bit about what you said. Yeah. I have been thinking a lot about that co-creation that I was just talking about between um, us and the author, but also that it's maybe not a duality, that it's actually a triangle that's creating this, which is us, the narrator, so us, the narrators and the authors and the listeners. Absolutely. That what Absolutely. the finished product is and how it's interpreted and how it's understood and how it becomes part of the listener is part of creating the audiobook. Absolutely. That it's more than just me and the author doing this thing together and co-creating this thing, that it's not actually made live until the listener is part of that too. And that's so exactly was so, so said so well in that quote that you just said. So thank you. Thank you. Oh, wow. Well, Vikas and Sarah, this has been a delightful conversation today. Oh my gosh, so much to dig into. Vikas, thank you, thank you, thank, thank you. you for being with us and for thank making time for to, to talk with us today. This thank has you for having It's been wonderful. Thank you. Have a lovely day, everyone. <laughs> you too. Thanks so much for listening to Crafting Audiobooks. We've been your hosts, Sarah Beth Goer. And Jennifer Jill Araya. Wishing you happy audiobook listening and or crafting. Bye for now.